this this really gives us a good starting point for the conversations that we are about to have today. And and I want to just jump straight to our first panelist. Hi everybody, again this is Roble. Um, I'm going to try and move very fast because I want to give the other panelists an opportunity to speak to you and also give you enough time to um, to ask some questions later. So the three main areas I'll be covering today is base, uh, basics on pivots. And then we're going to do a case study of a company called Blockbuster and how it failed to um, adjust to market changes and which ultimately resulted in its failure. And then an example of businesses adapting to the current environment. I'll be asking two questions. Um, um, and uh, if you know the answer, you, uh, you can just put your response on the messaging and uh, the administrators will be tracking it. And then at the end of my presentation, I'll give the answer. The people who get the question right first will get a free book. And uh, if people don't get any of the questions right, I think uh, the administrators will just pick somebody randomly. So moving on. So what does uh, what does pivot mean in terms of uh, uh, business? Uh, so according to the lean startup methodology, a pivot is essentially a shift in business strategy to test a new approach regarding a company's business model or product after receiving direct or indirect feed feedback. This is usually in reference to normal business activity, uh, but uh, we are obviously in extraordinary times and we are getting feedback from, from the market in various um, and channels. Uh, so how is the COVID-19 pandemic impacting businesses? I'm sure all of you have an idea and you, you've stated that in your, in your uh, polling response. Uh, there's obviously changes in consumer behavior which could impact your product or how you deliver it. Changes in laws uh, could require you to adjust your business model. We've seen uh, there are curfews in Kenya and other places like where I live, there are certain businesses are entirely shut down. So uh, and restaurants and places like that are completely shut down. So those businesses have to adapt. And your product might uh, or service might become obsolete. So the first question I have for you um, is, in my book, I write about a tech company that started off as a status update service, but after realizing their customers were using their service for something else, they quickly pivoted to adapt to this new need, allowing them to reach great success. Name the company. And I'll give you a tip. Nearly all of you use it, and you probably have it on your, on your phone. So, if somebody does a guessing game, you'll get it right. Moving on, you can just uh, type your answer in the in the messaging, and the administrator will track that. Uh, so, um, a pivot's expensive. Uh, the reality is, uh, pivots are not free, and uh, it could take time and cost money. But there are ways that you can uh, reduce this. You can make incremental changes, and uh, so if you figure out you need to make a significant diversion from your current business model. You don't need to make the entire change immediately. You can make it incrementally and continue to benefit from the economic benefits of those changes as you, as you gradually pivot. Uh, it is also important to improve your customer feedback loop. So you're constantly getting uh, feedback from your customer in the market that you are on the right track. And also another way is to find strategic partners. So for example, if you need to do an and start offering your service through the e-commerce platform, there might not be a need for you to actually build an e-commerce platform. You could find a strategic partner that already has that infrastructure that allows you to work with them on that. So uh, we also have to be uh, um, cognitive of the fact that uh, we are trying to make changes in very difficult times. Um, if you're serving the consumer market or the enterprise or the government, there's lower demand uh, from those markets. Uh, there's also uh, a need for businesses to preserve their cash. You know, so you're, you're afraid of investing because you want your money to, to last you longer and through this uh, pandemic. And also all sources of capital are, are reducing. So you're also really searching for uh, ways to continue to um, secure funding to keep you going. 
so um, there's also obviously sometimes a, a despair and a feeling that we might not succeed, but you know, as entrepreneurs, uh, to be an entrepreneur is to be eternally optimistic. And uh, we have to know that there is, uh, with this pandemic, there's gonna be a lot of opportunity for a lot of people to succeed. And we have to be optimistic. We have to stick to the fundamentals. We have to preserve cash adapt to changes in the market and find ways to excel. So moving on to our case study today, we're gonna to be looking at Blockbuster. Uh, if uh, some of you are not familiar with Blockbuster, it was a video rental uh, company. Um, I grew up in Kenya uh, in the 90s uh, and, uh, and, and um, they, they used to be stores uh, mostly owned by Indian merchants that uh, rented out. So it's a similar type of business. And it was very big. Um, I think the valuation in 1994 was 8 billion, uh, which is close to around 900 million Kenya shillings at this time. And if you compare it to Safaricom, maybe I think the last time I checked was 1.5 trillion. Uh, and if you adjust this for time value, it was as close to the value of uh, Safaricom at that time. Uh, what happened in 1997, there was the introduction of the DVD. And DVD provided a better quality video for people to watch, and it was a lighter uh, and, um, storage of, of movies. Yeah? And the same year, a new company came out called Netflix, which tried to take advantage of this new innovation in the market. And they, instead of having thousands of stores all over the world, like uh, Blockbuster had 2,500 stores across the world, uh, they decided to put an online catalog of movies where people could select the movie and then it was shipped to them uh, by mail within three days. So they had they didn't have to deal with the infrastructure cost, so they're able to even offer the movies for cheaper. Uh, but um, Blockbuster at that time uh, was uh, not afraid of this new innovation and they didn't make any changes. Um, in 2000, Netflix was still struggling. It was a new company. Uh, they needed a lot of marketing costs and they didn't have the money. So they decided to offer themselves for sale to Blockbuster for $50 million. Uh, and if you can think about $50 million for a company like Blockbuster valued at $8 billion, it was probably equivalent to their stationary cost in a year. But they refused to purchase it. They did not see the value and they completely ignored it. And it took them another seven years to actually introduce DVDs. Um, in the meantime, there was also an additional innovation that was coming into the market, which was streaming online that people now did not even need a DVD. They could just, because of the improvements in broadband and, and internet access uh, and, and streaming was now becoming a, a, a reality. Uh, and Blockbuster, again, was still not able to adjust this uh, reality. And in 2010, they ended up um, practically shutting down and a lot of the assets were sold for $24 million. Uh, and compared to uh, Blockbuster, uh, Netflix uh, currently is valued at uh, $203 billion and they were really able to adjust to this market shift and, and really become uh, uh, a technology company because if you think about 1997 when they were mailing DVDs it was not uh, uh, it, they did not have as, as many kind of engineers and whatever to, to support uh, a, a technology company but by, by at this time they're practically considered a technology company and they have a huge engineering staff that allows them to offer their services online um, and, and this, uh, this uh, case study really shows a shift between brick, brick and mortar and online and the dangers for companies that are not keeping an eye on market signals to adapt and to change the environment. And what can we learn from this? Uh, there are a couple of lessons I picked out. There are many lessons, but the three that I picked out is being small can be an advantage because um, it was difficult for Netflix and Blockbuster to reduce their overhead because they had all this infrastructure cost. But with Netflix being so small, they were, they were not burdened with legacy uh, uh, systems and, and, and businesses, and they were able to adapt, adapt to this market set. 
And for you as SMEs, you also can put yourself in this category as being lean and small to adapt to these changes. Um, it is also very important not to be uh, complacent and constantly be monitoring changes within the market and seeing how it impacts you and how somehow you can also take advantage. And the third one is major changes in the marketplace creates opportunity. So not only this was a technological innovation that caused Blockbuster to fail, their business model to fail, but if you look at COVID, it's going to have a lot of uh, changes in consumer behavior and there's going to be opportunities for uh, lean and smaller companies to take advantage and, and actually surpass bigger companies which are struggling to adjust to, to, to the changes. Uh, so there's always a need here to be optimistic. If we look also in 2008, the financial crisis, there are quite a couple of companies that came out of that, including uh, Amazon, I mean, including uh, Uber that came out of that period. So my second question is, uh, Blockbuster had one uh, had one particular policy that their customers felt was exploitative. This policy was partly responsible for hastening their demise after a, a viable competitor entered the market. What is this policy? So uh, again, you're free to um, to respond um, online. So uh, I'm, I'm running out of time. I'll quickly go through uh, the, the, the different and options and, and the way business is adjusting. So for service industries like yoga, fitness instructions, uh, they are not able at this time to uh, serve their customers through studios and gyms. And so a lot of them have now moved online. The cost for them has been minimal because all you need is a good internet connection, a video, and a way to accept payments. And, and I've also saw and some of the and wildlife reserves in Kenya are now also allowing foreigners to, to buy 20-minute uh, drives where and people are, are attracting that. Um, producers, farmers, and other producers are selling directly to consumers because they're losing some of their customers like restaurants. And so they're selling directly to consumers. And one of the good uh, partnerships that we've seen in Kenya is between Trigger and Jumia. Uh, Trigger didn't have to and create their own e-commerce platform. They just uh, partnered with Jumia, which can save them money. And also uh, there are companies which are being threatened to, to become um, extinct. And one of them now people are questioning is Airbnb. So there is gonna be that uh, aspect that all of us have to be prepared for. So Alex, uh, take it back to you. I'm done with my, oh, I have one more. The two answers, um, uh, first answer was WhatsApp and the second answer is Macy policy. So that were the two answers. Alex, uh, back to you. Thank you, Roble. I don't know how many submissions we have received to your your questions. I, I will wait for the, for the organizers to tell me that in a short while. And hopefully two people get to walk away with your book and Silicon Valley. It's a fantastic book uh, that I have also already started uh, looking through and I actually want to just uh, pick out a couple of things that I know you have in that book and, and it's just be, and as, as the audience thinks about any questions they might have for you um, so you know you had a company uh, coin fling before which you had to pivot into 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 the current company um, and you you really explore the topic of of failure quite a bit in your in your book, uh, and and quite interesting for me was the the thinking around life after failure. Um, I know earlier I said that that one of the differences between Silicon Valley and the rest of the world is that in Silicon Valley, failure is celebrated. You know, people go on platforms and say I failed, and everybody. Mm -hmm. But you you told me that 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 is actually changing now. Um, it's not being as celebrated as it used to be uh, back in the day. And we live in a society here uh, in Kenya, for instance, where, you know, when you fail, you go under the table and you make sure nobody talks to you for the next three years until you rise back up again. I just wanted you to speak a little bit more to that. Uh, you've talked about pivoting. You've talked about uh, being small, being a good thing, because it allows you to be nimble and everything. What happens to, I mean, and when I look even at the poll questions, you know, 18% of our respondents and 65% of the audience actually responded saying that their businesses have been rendered redundant. Mm -hmm. What happens to these guys? What would you say to these folks? 
So um, uh, thank you for that question, Alex. Um, I would say, um, you know, failure um, should definitely not be celebrated, um, but it should not be looked at as a bad thing. I think uh, really I look at business from a scientific perspective. I think anytime you're coming up with a business idea, you're, you're proposing a hypothesis and, and you have to test that hypothesis in different ways. And mm. so for us in the technology world, we, call, we, we have what is called a minimum viable product. So you enter the market with a small uh, test of the product and you grow from there. So it's a process of continuing to iterate as, as, you, as you search and find what is called a product market fit. And so for, for, for me, uh, I believe that, um, I think as an entrepreneur, you'll always be an entrepreneur. Everybody who's an entrepreneur knows they cannot imagine doing anything else but business. Uh, and uh, the reality is a lot of companies, a lot of and successful entrepreneurs failed failed three or four times before they found their product market fit. So uh, besides the social uh, stigma of failure, uh, as entrepreneurs, you're always a maverick. You're always looking at things that people are not, and you should not be focused on the social and stigma and focus on just trying to hone your skills and find that product market fit uh, so you can succeed. Thank you for that. There's a, there's a quote by Jeff Bezos that's a favorite of mine. He says, uh, be persistent in your vision, but flexible in your pursuit. And I think that's what you're talking, you're alluding to, which is stay true to that vision. But you know, just because this one way did not work, rise up, try again. And, and, and I'm sure Lona knows a lot about, about that, uh, given, given the journey that she's been on. So thank you so much, Roble, uh, and much appreciated for the time that you've, that you've shared with us.